Hi, and welcome to the At Peace Parents podcast. I'm Casey, and I'm here to empower you in your decision making as a parent of a demand avoidant child. My goal is to share insights that will generate aha moments and support your connection with your child. I'm a mom of two amazing little boys, one of whom is PDA, and I've worked with hundreds of parents just like you to teach them how to lead their child out of burnout and find the clarity, peace, and sense of community they need. Have you been told any of the following sentences by a pediatrician, a therapist, or someone else in your life? You need to be more consistent in your boundaries with your child. You need to have more consistent meal times in order for your child to have healthy eating habits and be healthy. You need to be more consistent in your screen time limits so that they don't have delays in self-regulation, language, and learning. And then finally, when things potentially are escalating, there's the exploration of Well, there may be disorganized attachment or reactive attachment, okay? So these are very common questions that parents of pathologically demand avoidant children and teens are asked, and sometimes it's doubled down on, especially by those professionals in positions of authority. So I have heard all these questions, and today I'm going to teach you about some of the flawed assumptions about causality versus correlation that underlie these questions and why it has led to so much confusion, self-loathing, blame, and shame for us as parents of PDA children and teens. I'm going to start with a story from my own life that illustrates this concept, and then we're actually going to learn about omitted variable bias which sounds like a very esoteric academic word, but it's something I want to teach you guys because I think it will alleviate your anxiety and it will make you feel more empowered to advocate for your child and not receive these types of questions that have inherent assumptions about you causing these problems and to be able to view them for what they are, which is actually oftentimes just a reflection of the ignorance of the person asking you. (laughs) And we're going to talk about that. Okay. So about six years ago, my son, my son's eating was always quite picky in some ways, but you know, he would eat lots of different things like mango strips, sweet potatoes. I had those little, you know, vegetarian nuggets that I would feed him. And so he had a fairly varied diet. Looking back, it's the most varied his diet has ever been. But after the birth of my second son, William, and as my son moved towards the age of four, four and a half, he increasingly started to reduce his eating. And at that time, I was looking at it as picky eating, right, as many of us do. And so when I started to ask for advice from the pediatrician and from other people in my life, it was often like, well, you need to keep exposing them. And, you know, we might need to have some gentle incentives and and consequences. And at the time, I had no idea how my son's brain worked. And so that's what I did. But as I started to introduce more consequences for not eating and more encouragement to eat, his brain was perceiving threat because that's how the PDA brain works. And so it got to a point where he would just suddenly drop something that he had loved forever, like mango strips, you know, and in that case, I was trying to limit the mango strips because they were sweet and full of sugar. And then he, because I was worried if he eats those now, he's not going to eat like the protein later, right? We've all gone through this, but I had no idea about the logic of his brain, right? And so he got to a point where he was just starting to refuse eating and it was terrifying. And this unbeknownst to me, was as he was moving into nervous system burnout, as many of you know about now or have experienced with your own children. And his stickiest basic need was food, feeding. And so, you know, I came to the pediatrician in tears when my son was about four and a half. And I was like, he won't eat. Like, I'm being consistent in what you're telling me to do. And I just, I can't get him to eat. He increasingly is stopping eating. I'm really worried about this. And you know, while she, a female pediatrician, had been focused on like, 
you know, rewards and sanctions or uh, consequences around eating or like encouragement and exposure. She then switched into more academic mode and she was like, well, we do see an association between consistent home cooked meals and sitting down at the table and healthy eating habits among children. And so what you really need to do is you need to reduce your work hours and make sure you come home to prepare the food and make sure he sits down and so you have this home cooked meal for him. And, you know, I was already kind of in my own survival brain. I was incredibly stressed. I was trying to manage a newborn, him, and also a pretty intense corporate environment of a job. And I said, you know, I'll do my best and we do cook and we do try sit down meals, but he refuses to sit and it doesn't seem to be related to that. And then she, she doubled down on this study and this association, which Side note, association means correlation, not causation, which we're going to cover. And was just like, well, I am a doctor. I'm a medical doctor and I have three, I have three grown children and I found a way to be home to cook and make sure I had uh, these family meals. And that's why my children have healthy eating habits. So she's drawing the causal link between I did home cooked meals and made them sit at the table. Therefore, they have healthy eating habits. Okay. In the moment, I couldn't think logically or draw on the 15 years of social science training and work that I have. But once I got over how distressing that was, I leaned back on my training as a social scientist and I thought to myself, that's not it. That's not it. And now I understand it completely now that we have the language for it. And I'm going to explain to you through the, through what we're learning today, which is called omitted variable bias which just means that our logic model or our regression or the causality we're drawing between two variables, it fails to include one or more relevant variables. What are you talking about, Casey? Don't worry, I'm gonna get into it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three areas where parents often get blamed and the causality for the problems is ascribed to the parent, to the parent behavior causing the problem. And we're going to deconstruct this together so that you feel more confident. We're going to talk about family meals through the lens of my experience. We're going to talk about screens and I'm going to briefly bring up, um, a PubMed study that I, that I looked over for this, for this teaching. And then we're going to talk a little bit about attachment. And this is particularly relevant if you have an adopted child or have a, a child in foster care because so many of the parents in that space come to me from um, an attachment lens, okay? And it doesn't mean they're not, that's not relevant, but we're going to talk about these three things. Okay, so what did this pediatrician do? She looked at this variable, the X, being family meals, right? Causes Good eating habit. And yes, I am just dorking out because why not? And I know it's backwards, actually. Sorry. Okay, so the X is family meals. The Y is good eating habits. What is the omitted variable? The omitted variable is that the reason I couldn't have family meals or get my kid to sit down at the table was PDA because he was PDA. And the PDA was also the reason for his eating habits. But without understanding the neurotype, or the fact that my child was neurodivergent, it was just your actions are causing this negative behavioral outcome, okay? And so often this is the case when the pediatrician or the therapist or a well-meaning peer, in-law, or grandparent might not even realize that they're doing this. However, we really need to understand the difference between causation or causality and correlation and also be able to identify what we're not controlling or measuring for, which is often your child's neurotype, okay? PDA, neurodivergence, or your child's neurotype is very often in studies, academic studies, or the logic of professionals not included, okay? So it's not being included in the statements that they're making. Okay, so let's talk briefly about what I mean by omitted variable bias with a different example. So here's a very simple one. Studies show that there's a correlation between the number of books in a family's home 
and academic achievement for their child, okay? But if we're not controlling for this third variable, which is the parent IQ, the parent IQ causes or is correlated, but causes them to buy more books. And the parent IQ is causing the child's academic achievement. But if we don't measure for that, we think, oh, we can just put a bunch of books in our house and not do anything else. And that will cause my child to have academic achievement. And that is a reflection of omitted variable bias. So how does this apply to you? Okay, let's take screens. And I just want to start with my story, a little bit about my story of screens, because this was also a very huge source of stress for me. Why? Because all of the studies showed that screens as the X, as the causal, the independent variable, cause delays in language, problem with self-regulation, and lower academic achievement in different studies, okay? So we have screens as the causal variable or the independent variable, and then we have the outcome variable, which is language, self-regulation, academic achievement. So of course, as a parent, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, more screens means their self-regulation is going to get even worse, their language is going to be delayed more, and they're not going to be achieving academically. Of course, I'm going to limit screens. And of course, I'm going to stress out about it. And of course, it's going to keep me up at night. And this was exactly where I was as well, because I, I hadn't like taken a dive into the literature, because at the time, I was limiting screens, right? I was like you, I was limiting screens to one hour a day, I was stressing out every time my child was on a screen. And I held that limit about a year into my son's burnout, okay? And this was very difficult, obviously, because we know that screens are often one of the things that can regulate a PDA nervous system. It's not a recommendation for screens, it's just an observation. And often you have to make a decision between you being the safe nervous system and accommodating the child and the screen, okay? Which is not a cost benefit decision that parents of neurotypical children have to make in the same way. However, when my son, when it was during the pandemic, I had both kids home. I did not have an au pair, a nanny, anyone helping me with childcare. I wasn't even seeing my family. And I was physically like barely able to get through the day and keep everyone safe. And sometimes I couldn't keep everyone safe. And so at a certain point when I hit rock bottom, I just sort of gave up and I was like, fine, you can be on the screen, right? And I'm sure many of you have gotten to this point. So at that moment, I wasn't diving into PubMed or Google Scholar or looking into peer reviewed journal articles. I was a stressed out mom, just like everybody else. I was in my survival brain. I wasn't using my frontal lobe to think about the logic or quote, omitted variables, but now I am. So here we are. <laughs> okay. So today, I wish I had had more time, but I had a busy day, but I did look at one of these review studies in PubMed that was about the different studies that have been done about screen time use, whether it's passive or interactive, and the way that it impacts language, self-regulation, academic achievement for children be between the years of zero and five years old. Okay. And so it did show patterns of it negatively impacting that. However, the point I want to make here is that when we have an X screen time, and then we have a Y, which is these negative outcomes, when we're not controlling for PDA or any other type of neurodivergence, which in these studies, it was not, we're not controlling for the omitted variable, which is both likely causing the amount of screen time because the child is gravitating towards this as something to regulate them. They're having much more self-regulation issues already and the parents making decisions within different constraints than a neurotypical child. And so the neurotype is actually leading to the conditions causally for more screen time. On the other side of things, the neurotype PDA is leading to, or ADHD or whatever neurotype it is in the neurodivergent realm, is also correlated on the outcome variable with more difficulty with language, more difficulty with self-regulation, and potentially delays in academic achievement. Okay, so we just have to understand that it's not necessarily the screen 
that is causing that for the children for whom it is showing in the big sample that it is bringing down those dependent variable indicators, so those outcomes, okay? Especially because of the age group we're looking at, which is zero to five. If you're a parent of a pda -er, you know better than anyone that most of us did not even realize that our children were PDA or that such a thing existed until they went off to school or a second child was born or, you know, there was a big structural change in the family. And then a bunch of people don't, parents don't even realize it until their children are like 11, 12, 13, right? So given that PDA is not recognized in the DSM-5 and that it's not going to be diagnosed in early intervention, these kids exist and they're including in large end, included in large end samples for studies, okay? So I'm not here to be like screens are good or screens are bad. I'm here because I want to alleviate some of the fear for you and anxiety and also prompt you to feel more empowered and not blamed for these outcomes which are associated with your child's neurodivergence and not necessarily your parenting practices, even though certain studies would imply as such, or pediatricians or others in your life use these studies against you for your decisions, okay? So I'm going to pause there, whether you're listening on the podcast or here with me live. I love for you to just drop an emoji and let me know if this is making sense. Okay, because we're talking about a statistical concept, but we're applying it to our day to day lives as parents of PDA children and teens. All right, so the last area that I want to talk about within this frame of like, does X cause Y? Does parenting cause these behavioral outcomes? Or is it more complex than that? And actually, we don't need to completely blame ourselves constantly, or allow others to make us doubt our parenting practices or choices. Okay. And this is in the space of attachment. Okay, so this is particularly relevant for parents if you have a adopted child, a fostered child, a child with medical trauma, okay? Because often the parents who end up in the PDA space have gone through more of a trauma-informed or attachment lens and it's helped but not addressed everything, right? But a lot of them have felt like, and this happened to me too, where, and I don't have an adopted child, where the assumption from others was he must have a lack of attachment and that's why he's behaving like this, right? And I'll just say out of intuition and survival, I was attachment parenting against my will. Okay, I did not want an attachment parent. I was like, have we're gonna have my kid on schedules, I was gonna sleep train, I was gonna be all the things, right? And because I was trying to survive with a a baseline of a child who was in fight flight, an infant, I co-slept, breastfed on demand constantly, like constantly. He was the biggest chublet you've ever seen because he was literally constantly breast breastfeeding as oral regulation. And I wore him in a wrap for basically the six first six months of his life. So all of these things were not a mindful or intentional decision. It was out of survival, right? And so I wasn't like an attachment parent. I was a, by choice, I was an attachment parent by default. So when people would talk to me about attachment, I was just like, what are you talking about? right? There isn't a quote, lack of attachment that doesn't make sense to me. I, I was like an attachment parent, like where was there a lack of attachment, right? And so I've thought about this, especially as I've worked with a broader array of parents, some of whom have adopted children and, and they're told, oh, this is a lack of attachment, okay? But something we have to understand about attachment is it's not one of the things that bothers me about attachment, and I'll say I don't dislike attachment as a lens, I just think often it can be wielded against parents of PDA children, and that I dislike. It can often be the causality is the parent's behavior causes the lack of attachment. I'm using X variables because those are the independent variables, and that leads to the behavior. When actually the omitted variable, which influences 
all the things, the parent's behavior, the attachment between the parent and child, and the behavior of the infant, toddler, child, is this omitted variable of an undiagnosed, unidentified neurodivergent child, in this case, PDA. And it's particularly impactful in a negative way for us as parents in the PDA space because we often have received constant negative feedback from our own children while we're engaging in attachment parenting, okay? So what we have to understand is that Yes, absolutely. Parenting has an impact on attachment, which has an impact on behavior. But we also need to account for what is causing the parent's behavior in response to and according to their intuition of their child. Okay. And so when they're constantly experiencing fight, flight, or freeze, or shut down behavioral expressions of this nervous system disability as a parent, starting from infancy or toddlerdom or childhood, that has a profound impact on the parent's behavior towards the child. And often it's intuitively accommodating, right? But it's also traumatic, right? So of course it could influence attachment, right? But we can't just blame it on like this parent isn't parenting right and therefore it led to an attachment disorder and therefore we have this behavior, okay? So then we have the behavior, yeah, we have the behavior which may be caused by the infant child teen, which influences the parent and their behavior towards the the child. So you have this bi-directionality and causality going both ways. And of course, not every practitioner is like this. Not everyone who views attachment is like this. But this is a common pattern that I've observed when working with hundreds of families with PDA children. And so we have to understand that we need the logic of causality and an understanding of what's being left out here that we're not accounting for and what could be causing this behavior that's not just the decisions I make about screen time limits or whether or not I have three square meals a day home cooked from scratch on the table or, you know, whether or not I'm consistent in boundaries, right? Often it's like you're not consistent enough in boundaries, that's causing your child's behavior, but really there's a bi-directionality there. Often parents are intuiting they need to be more flexible and lower demands because of their child's responses and reactions, and so they are less consistent with boundaries, (laughs) right? Like the causality is going both ways. So, I wanted to introduce you guys to this idea as a way of feeling more empowered, more capable of making decisions based on your specific child and allowing yourself to follow your intuition and not blame yourself. So that was the purpose of today's teaching. And I hope you didn't mind me dorking out a bit and talking about statistical things. All right, my friends, I'm going to jump off. I hope this was supportive of you. It was good to see you. And we will talk again soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, everyone, for being here with me at the At Peace Parents podcast. This is your source for all things related to understanding, supporting, accommodating, and advocating for your PDA child. To go deeper on any of these topics, check out my course offerings and masterclasses at the website www.atpeaceparents.com. To completely transform the way you think about and relate to your child and to bring peace and stability to your home, join us for the next cohort of the Paradigm Shift program.